Um, thank you all so much for being with us today. Uh, my name is Caitlin. I'm one of the environmental educators at VINS. So thank you all so much for joining us on our very first virtual Owl Friday for this year's uh, Owl Festival, the eighth um, that we've done. And so we, uh, I, I'd like to invite you all to our Owl Festival in person if you are able. On April 15th, we'll be celebrating all things Owl. Uh, and so there's gonna be games and live owls to see, um, lots of things to do. Um, and so please join us on our, uh, April 15th. We also have a couple of virtuals coming up. So next week on April 7th, we have the Teton Raptor Center who's gonna be talking about their Poo Poo Project, which is a great initiative to protect owls from some of those uh, pipes around the country and um, all across uh, you know, different countries as well. So a really cool project to learn about. And then the next Friday is uh, April 14th, uh, the Owl Research Institute will be talking about their research on great gray owls. So if you haven't signed up to come to those virtuals, uh, please um, kind of uh, sign up so you can join us for those as well. And so VINS, our mission is to motivate people to care about their environment. And we do it through education, research and wild bird rehabilitation. So we are really, really excited today to be doing these kind of programs to teach um, ourselves and our community about different owls from across the country uh, and, um, and, and how we can help them. And so I'd like to thank anybody who took the time to uh, do a donation for their viewing today. Uh, that donation will go to doing more of our work. So I, we, we really appreciate that. And so without further ado, I will introduce uh, Bob Fox, who is from Wild at Heart, a rescue rehabilitation and release center for birds of prey in Arizona. Uh, he'll be uh, teaching us about his work establishing habitat for burrowing owls and their project with captive rearing cactus ferruginous pygmy owls. And so we're really excited to learn more about these species. So thank you, Bob, for joining us today, and I'll leave it to you. Great, thank you very much. Uh, welcome to everyone from Wild at Heart. And I'm gonna get myself set up here for this share screen. All right, thank you, Eric. Well, Wild at Heart's a uh, wildlife rehab center that uh, was incorporated in, back uh, in 94. My wife and I uh, founded this. And uh, we started uh, with the idea we'd just be working with owls um, and barn owls were our specialty. But all of a sudden we started getting other calls and we got a little bit crazy. So as we've been going along, we see that we are really focused now on the rehabilitation of all birds of prey. Our primary focuses right now are on the burrowing owls and we have a captive breeding program for the cactus fruit and its pygmy owl. The uh, Western Burrowing Owl, you can see these beautiful pictures here by Joel Sartori for the, for the ARC project, um, are a wonderful little species. They're a diurnal uh, crepuscular owl that range all across the, the West from Canada down into Mexico and beyond. They live in burrows underground. They, their diet, uh, insects, small rodents, birds, uh, they're really more diurnal, crepuscular, but we find them out throughout the 24 hours of the day. They are somewhat communal in nature and they really love the grasslands. That's their, their, their prime habitat. Uh, because, and you can see this little juvenile here having a nice uh, mouthful of bug. Their range extends, as you can see up in through Canada, they're pretty limited now in the plain states due to uh, the destruction of the prairie dog colonies. Down in through here, we have some year round and non-breeding areas along the coast down into, the, down into here. Their range has been really uh, decimated over the last uh, number of decades due to construction, due to the poisoning of prairie dog colonies um, and that sort, of, uh, that sort of problems. You can see here over the last hundred years, the fossorial mammal redu uh, reduction has in impacted them tremendously. Uh, the conversion of grassland to agriculture, uh, you know, and right now we're dealing with a lot of this with solar plants and wind, and just the continuing development of, of suitable habitat makes it very difficult for this species to find proper 
environments to uh, nest in and to uh, find good habit and find good food. So back in the early 90s, as we were doing our, our rehab, all of a sudden a developer dropped off three fledgling burrowing owls. We didn't know where they came from. We didn't have much experience with them. And when it was time for them to release, my late wife uh, looked at me and said, you know, you can't just toss them out in the air and say, find a hole to live in. You have to build them something. And so of course, my only response was, <clears throat> yes, dear. So we started doing um, the artificial burrow system. It was a very, very jury rigged system to begin with, um, but it was it worked. Uh, we'd done some research and found that they were holding the birds for a short time at the, at the center and then putting them under the artificial tents for a week or so. But we realized that really wasn't enough time for them to break fidelity to their old territory and to create new site fidelity at their at their new one. They you can hear an, an idea of some of the areas they live in. This is the, the face of a wash uh, the, in a canal uh, that was probably 12 feet uh, high, and they're kind of right in the middle there. They will find any hole they can to live in. This was in the middle of a street in Phoenix, Arizona, right in front of a high school. And they were living in that hole and the little owls would pop their heads up and if cars were going along the outside lane, they'd just watch it go by. A car coming down their lane, they'd duck down and let it pass by and pop back up. So I called our, our, my city contacts and they said, uh, give us an hour. They sent a, a road crew out, block the lanes and gave them the opportunity to trap the birds and uh, remove them. So it worked out very well for them. Nobody got hurt. And there were, at that point, it was out of nesting seasons. So there was no eggs I had to worry about. Otherwise, I would have had to ex excavate that asphalt and go into the burrow. They have all sorts of habitat. Here you can see they're, they're, act, they're just desperate for any type of hole they can find. We'll see them. This is a concrete slab there underneath. We see them in sidewalks, under streets. Um, in pipes, in canals, in drains, anything they can find to live in, including odd places. Uh, cemeteries are not necessarily the best place, but we have found them there. Uh, I got a call last year from one of the, the native communities and they were actually brewing under uh, some of their uh, grave sites also. So the owls were removed and everything, everything worked out. So because we, we find them in such odd places, uh, it just shows how desperate they are for that good, healthy habitat. And we want to make sure that they stay nice and healthy. So it's very important for us to make sure that we find good, good places for them. One of the odd behaviors that they have, we call it decoration. And here you'll see some of the June bugs, some of the little feathers and, and pellets and so on. They will bring material back to their nest like feathers, dung, um, anything they can to decorate the ex exterior of their, of their nest and even down into the burrow itself. And we believe this is due to two reasons. Number one, it will attract insects that they can then consume. It also helps to mask their scent from predators. Now, that's really a, a really driven behavior. Well, we've actually seen them as we release them from their tents. We had one fly out into a into a uh, sheep uh, flock, grab dung, and fly it right back to that burrow and start decorating it. And they always don't know they don't, what they're getting. And since they have no sense of smell, they'll bring things back they think might be dung. Uh, it could be bark. It could be styrofoam. I found old socks, honeycomb, all sorts of weird items in their burrows. As you can see here, they are pressured by development. This little guy, his burrow was just, he's standing at the edge of uh, the face of the little ridge there. And his burrow was down about eight feet from that. And this heavy equipment was passing back and forth throughout them all day long and getting ready to actually eliminate that burrow. So we were able to get out and trap them. The birds that are around human habitation all the time are very adaptable. Uh, like I say, we find them under streets in, in suburban areas, and that's one of their saving graces. 
the burrowing owls are loved by the community of humans around them. So when they see signs of development, my phone starts blowing up and we get out and talk to the people involved to make sure that the owls have, are safe and are not being harmed or the burrows are not being harmed. And we work in conjunction with the Arizona uh, Game and Fish Department and U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service if there is any sort of uh, encroachment issues that are not being taken care of by the developers. We have set up this program so that it makes it really fairly simple for development to continue while we actually get out and remove the birds. It's taken a long time to establish the correct permits. Um, in the early days, there were, there were no uh, requirements. There were no set procedures for doing relocations of burrowing owls. So over time, working with Fish and Wildlife Service uh, Permits Office, we were able to actually codify the regulations and, and getting into a special use permit that was a requirement for each and every development that was undergoing relocation process. And that process would generally take about 60 days, and which is a long time to wait in between for something to happen. So if that, if the owls are there, construction has started, we build a about a hundred foot perimeter around that uh, for safety, allowing the owls to live until that permit would come in. So I'd worked uh, very diligently with Fish and Wildlife to try and get a programmatic permit that would allow me to go out at any time. And so I, we had long conversations and big meetings and, you know, with do a special uh, scientific collecting permits. I filed everything. They sent it back saying, no, that really doesn't quite fit the criteria. So I sent a, another form in. No, it still doesn't really work. And this is months have gone by. And the program, the permit manager said, well, you know, I'm going off on special assignment, so I'm not going to be here. Another person is taking over. So I started talking to her. And her response, well, we really need to have you have a standalone permit where you can go out at any time and, you know, X number of birds a year and a three-year permit. And I said, yes, exactly. That's what I want. We don't do that. And I go, oh, <laughs> thank you. But through working with them, we were able to finally get a standalone permit that allows me at any time to go out and remove the owls at risk when necessary. It has helped streamline the process and made the development community and the owl community much happier and healthier. Now, this is uh, how we will trap them. We use a, I use a call that's a subdominant juvenile a male call, and it attracts them in. And I sit and watch and wait. And as they go close enough to that little trap, they go in and boom. And we remove them from there, then bring them back to the center. Once they have been captured, I make sure I have the male and female, if at all possible, especially during nesting season, it's difficult to make sure that we have everybody out of there. So then we actually have to go in and excavate their burrows. Oop, this is going a little bit too fast. Uh, sorry about that. And uh, so this is a, actually a fairly simple one that was straight, straightforward, but these oftentimes will veer off left, right, they'll be wise. The burrow average is about eight to 10 feet in length, anywhere from two to five feet deep. But I have had them go over 30 feet long and seven feet deep, uh, which is a lot of work digging them out. Probably the worst I had was in uh, Lake Havasu City, which is up in northwestern Arizona, and they were in a very rocky wash, and the owls were at the very base of a uh, wash face, and there was about 10, 12 feet high, and as I started digging in, the burrow kept going down farther and farther. After about 12 hours of digging, I was in 19 feet, seven feet down at the very end of the burrow. I couldn't feel anything else in there, but I could hear chicks. And I go, oh my goodness. And I reached the very side of the burrow and there's a very small hole and I peeled that away and that's where the nesting chamber was. So that's why we don't use cameras because they were, they're very, uh, not, not very accurate. As you can see this is kind of an S shape going around through there. <clears throat> but once we get in, we find the nestlings, uh, bring them in, and they're 
hopefully we'll put them with their parents and the parents then continue to raise them and then they end up getting released. Clutch sizes are normally up to about eight. And depending on environment, anywhere from all eight to only one may survive the infant after fledging. They come out of the nest at about 10 days and they're very vulnerable to predators. And their predators are everything from, you know, raptors, uh, ground-based mammals, you know, foxes, badgers, snakes, et cetera. Um, so they are at, at quite a bit of risk. That's why they produce a lot of offspring. And occasionally they get into trouble. We get into some of these man-made areas and drains and so on, and they get tangled up. Uh, this was a very sad one where this group of young burrowing owls had been tangled up in uh, a line of some sort of cotton line and gotten completely tangled up. When we were able to pull them out, there was one that had already been deceased. They had been dragging around. They'd been in there for several days, but we were able to finally get everything separated and at least these two managed to survive and ended up getting released. But again, it's the public that sees these situations and allows us the opportunity to go in and remove them and make sure that they are safe and secure. Once we have the birds, the original process was we would hold them here for, you know, a minimum of 30 days, as long as 90 days, in order to break their fidelity to their home territory. This species is somewhat migratory. During the uh, uh, fall months, females in the first years will move out and head down south. Some go down into Mexico. The males will tend to stay and protect their territory. At the same time, we have birds from the north coming down temporarily into this, this habitat. So they, they are somewhat migratory, so we have to really establish uh, a new habitat for them. So this is one of our very early uh, beginnings of our tents. We started them off you know, ground level, put a, a box in for their nesting chamber, piled dirt on it, and then built these, this small little uh, tent enclosure that would house them. It would hold them there for 30 days. And that helps acclimate them to that burrow. And during that time, we have volunteers that go out on a daily basis to feed and water and care for them and, and monitor the situation. Once that uh, 30 days is up, that, that net enclosure comes down. And then we, uh, we uh, supplement feed them for another week or so because it takes time for the male, especially to establish his new hunting territory. And so there's a lot of pressure on him to make sure that he can actually accomplish that without any problems. So that's a big part of the process is establishing, you know, good habitat and allowing them to find that that really good nesting, that good nesting and uh, hunting area. They eat a lot of insects, as we said, small rodents, birds, the size of doves, red-winged blackbirds. Um, so they're very voracious, even small bunnies they will take and, uh, and bring back to their burrows. Again, here's a, a group of volunteers putting together one of the, the older style tents. We're getting ready to put the owls in there. Uh, so we work with a lot of different groups, uh, volunteer groups from high schools, from scout troops, from you know, uh, nature societies, in order to make sure that this habitat is done. One of the big issues we find now is there's not a lot more habitat left in our area around Maricopa County. So oftentimes these birds are being translocated anywhere from 75 to 100 miles away. And that's a lot of pressure on us to make sure these things uh, get taken care of. As you can see, this original tenting was done with PVC pipe and a nice screening, a little shade area for them. And it worked out really, really well, but it was very time consuming. All of this surface around the exterior had to be um, covered heavily with dirt to allow, make sure that they, they weren't pulled up so we didn't have coyotes or anything digging into that or they couldn't dig out. And an area here where the rocks are is what we would move those and that's where the food and water would be placed on a daily basis. So over the years, we've adapted our, our procedures for uh, building the habitat. And about oh, 10, 12 years ago, a gentleman named Greg Clark came to me and asked how he could help. 
And being an engineer, I said, well, we need someone to help build these tents. <laughs> Unfortunately, the poor guy has been working <laughs> for us ever since, putting in huge amounts of work and energy to get this done. Now you can see again, this is again, one of our older sites. And we're just introducing the bird into the, into the tube that goes straight in to the, uh, to the uh, burrow itself, but there's a slight bend in that so that we, it's a light trap and a predator trap. And over time, again, we keep evaluating and changing to make sure that we're doing the best thing that we can for them. Now here's the process of starting to put together some of this. You can see the deep trench. We dig about, a pit's about four and a half feet deep, and that gives you that, uh, that temperature gradient that's constant year round. The corrugated PVC comes out and curves up to the ground level, where it is then sleeved with hard PVC so that animals can't dig into that and break it up. We have had instances where a dog would you know, chew, the, chew the pipe and so on, so we've learned how to harden that using hardware cloth and other, other means to make sure that they aren't, they aren't torn up. Unfortunately, one of the situations we do find is that idiot people will go out and shove rocks down those, down those tubes. So it's a constant monitoring and making sure that they are open and safe. Because once those tubes are blocked, um, if they block the ball, they don't have a chance to get out. You'll see down here on the bottom, you can see the, the buckets that we use. Now, some of these are interconnected. So they have a front door and a back door. So it does give them a way to get out if not all, if one, if one tube is closed. And as we move forward, you can see we've changed from PVC to uh, steel pipe. And that was also a very sturdy, you know, well-built uh, enclosure. And we've actually survived microbursts with these. But again, it's a lot of process, a lot of work, putting all this together, wiring it, making sure there's no sharp objects no sharp points, nothing for them to get themselves caught into. And again, it's just a, a huge amount of work. We'll put in, we're not putting in, you know, one or two of these enclosures on a site. We may be putting in 30 or 40 or 100 burrows on a, on a location. And then when we do is we cap some of those to, and allows for expansion of the colony. It allows us to uh, bring other birds in to recruit uh, native birds to this site and to help really build up that population. And so again, you can see this was the larger tents that we used to use. In the early days, we put in a whole family unit, uh, maybe anywhere from up to 10 birds. And there would be four different burrow sections in here that they could use. Uh, research uh, with the World Owl Project and David Johnson has shown that we probably want to do more you know, single pairs or single small families. So we've adapted that now to using these pop-ups that work out very, very well. It removes a lot of the uh, hours putting together the frames and building those up. So it makes it a lot simpler. We can do a lot more tents in an area a lot quicker. And here's one of our finished, our, our new finished projects. And where the blocks are down here, that is, those are removed and that's where the food and the water is placed in. Now, these have been very successful and very predator proof until uh, late last year, we actually had a coyote uh, for the first time dig in and uh, unfortunately get one of our owls. So we, it was an area that we hadn't been in before. So we had to figure out a way to predator proof this even more. So we went out and we bought, I think 20 pounds of cayenne pepper and sprinkled that all around the base of the enclosures that we had. And after that was done, we had no more coyote problems. I don't think they liked the, the scent. So that really helped us to figure it out. We've also had situations where once the tents have been gone, we had a badger come in and tear up like 50 feet of our of our of our tunnels. So we're always a, it's always a fight trying to make sure that we're we're keeping them safe and secure. We have put in over 8,000 artificial burrows throughout Arizona, and 3,000 burrowing owls have been relocated to these different sites. We. Uh, we evaluate all types of habitat, creosote flats, 
uh, open desert, but we found that the irrigated farmland is really showing the best long-term success. Finding good, good-minded farmers and ranchers has been important, and they're a really wonderful working relationship, a great partnership. Once we can convince them that they're not the ones that are creating the problems, they're eating the problems that are created, you know, by digging the holes and to eat a lot of insects and so on. This process is a, does, doesn't come cheap, and there's no real government uh, funding for it, so it's all done through donations. Uh, we've gotten working with Arizona Audubon on uh, several projects. We've gotten some grants from them. Uh, the developers do pay for their care, so that covers part of the cost, but mostly it's done by personal donations. And we could not do that without the general public's involvement. And here we've got just some nice photos of our a little male relocated on his little perch, little signpost out here in the, the open area. And again, you can see the, let me go back to that one. You can see the corrugated PVC surrounded by the pipe and the uh, foam inside helps insulate that and keep everything nice and clean. You can see the little bit of prey drop and droppings down here on the bottom. This little guy came in, his beak is kind of misaligned. He's got an eye problem on the other side, but he ended up being successfully reintroduced back into the wild. Now, this is again, uh, artificial burrows on the old style where we're doing it on mounds. And that was fairly effective. Just some nice pictures here of them flying. What's really fun to watch is when it's time for them to uh, start learning how to fly, the dad will fly up and call to the young and get them to pop up and fly up. And so it's really an enjoyable part of the process. You can see how long their wings are. Their flight is fairly distinctive. They will fly low and dip up and down as they fly. And what's amazing is there was one uh, burrowing owl that was uh, captured in Tucson and banded, released, and 10 days later was found in uh, Canada. So they made a huge distance, uh, long distance flight in a very, very short time. The research says, oh, burrowing owls aren't going to be around cactus. Well, they don't read the research. They say they won't find them in trees or under trees. We find burrows under trees and, and owls perched in them quite frequently. The reason they don't want to be in cact around cactus is that hides their predators. You know, great horned owls nest in these saguaros. Uh, hawks nest in these saguaros. Uh, so as again, we're talking about they're, they're really at risk from predators. And there are two instances in the past that I have gotten great horned owls in that had been electrocuted and they had burrowing owls in their talons. A really bad day for both birds. Now, generally, they will have a clutch of up to eight eggs. This little girl right now, she just laid her ninth. So uh, I guess she can't count. Now, we have some beautiful little photos here of these little guys. We'll go back into that. So the burrowing owl is doing okay. Their numbers are still in decline because of habitat loss and uh, all of the issues that we've mentioned, but we're hopeful that we're seeing some progress in stemming that. We don't have the funding to do a lot of follow-up research because that takes a lot of time and energy, but we do have sites that have had continuous populations in our artificial burrow system for over 15 years. And they're constantly producing offspring and uh, thriving and doing quite well. So they oftentimes, some will migrate down south and we don't know what happens to them down there. Some may, ne may never return. Some migrate from the north and head back north in the spring. Other times they just stay on site. So it's a very interesting convoluted uh, migratory pattern that these guys will go through. And uh, they're a lot of fun to watch. So the wonderful part about the Burring Out Relocation Project is it's gotten a lot of community involvement. A lot of people are invested and intrigued by this species. 
and it has been a very successful program uh, to date. So hopefully we'll continue to be able to do this and help keep and protect this little species from being extirpated here. There used to be millions of them in the Plains states. But back in the 50s, a lot of the prairie dog colonies were poisoned to remove the prairie dog so the cattle wouldn't step in the prairie dog hole. By eliminating the prairie dogs, we eliminated the burrowing owls. They don't dig their own burrow. They will take over existing burrows and cohabit with some of the existing uh, you know, animals in there. But they can move a lot of dirt if the soil is soft. But once the burrowing owls left and the prairie dogs were gone, <clears throat> those tunnels all kind of filled up and wells in the area started going dry. Because what happened was all those tunnels that were allowing rain to come in and percolate down and recharge the groundwater were now clogged and the water was running off and not allowing it to be to recharge. So again, an inadvertent consequence of our human actions. So again, we move on to another species. This is the Cactus ferruginous pygmy owl. They are a small little owl that is at great danger here in Arizona. They're, uh, they were on the endangered, well, threatened list back in, uh, back in the 90s through the 2000s. They're small. You can see those of you who are familiar with the northern sawwets, their size. This is a northern pygmy owl, same size as the cactus fruit, just a little bit different coloration. Uh, but just want to give you an idea of their size. And again, they let they nest in saguaro cavities. They you know, eat small rodents, lizards, small birds, almost exclusively birds in the wintertime. And they are ferocious little birds. I have seen them put grown men on their knees when they will stick their talons in and bite. But they have this wonderful ability to always find the crease of a joint or the click of the nail. And their beaks and talons are extremely sharp and can be very, very painful. They are slightly dimorphic. You can see the difference between the barring and the tail between the male and the female. The male is much more uh, contrasted than in the female. Their habitat loss is due to urbanization and you know, invasive species of plants like bubble grass. Now, I've got a range map here that shows, these are kind of the estimated numbers right now. So Arizona, we're really relegated to a very small area of this species. Now there is some discussion on whether or not this is a subspecies or a separate species from those in uh, Mexico and in Texas. Uh, it's, a, it's been a flashpoint for a number of years as to whether or not they are recognized as a subspecies. And in the late uh, 1800s to the 1900s, we had them all the way up here into the Maricopa County near, in Phoenix area. But as we started to develop and the freeways were being built, roadways were being built, we interrupted the contiguous saguaro forest. And they are a sedentary uh, species, so they're not really moving much into other territories. So we have shrunk their habitat way down to the small area down here in southwestern, uh, south central Arizona. And again, it gives you a really good idea here of their, their range. This, the pink area is from you know, 1872 to 1970. And from 70 to 90, it had shrunk quite a bit. And now we're way down into this, this small area here. They were listed in 97. And there was a lot of, a lot of talk about how we can help protect this species. And while they were on the, uh, while they were listed, we had a number of conversations with U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and the Arizona Game and Fish Department, um, you know, landholders in other areas. How can we help safeguard this, this species? 
And our, our goal was to always to start a captive breeding program. That would be the, it seemed to be the logical thing. But because they were listed, we were not allowed to do anything in a positive way for this species. It would just let them be and uh, you know, not disturb their habitat. So in, uh, once they were delisted in 2006, Fish and Wildlife Service and Arizona Game and Fish went out and captured uh, 10 birds that were brought to us to start a captive breeding program. And again, we worked with some of the researchers, Glenn Crowdfoot, who's probably the most notable gentleman. Um, and we started developing our protocols for breeding. And it was a very interesting process, uh, to say the least. Uh, here we have you know, some nice fledglings and some adults out of uh, our first hatching. We had to build aviaries specifically for them. Uh, we wanted to make sure that the males and females could uh, come together uh, easily. And one of the problems we had was that uh, they, males and females, if the female didn't like the male and he introduced himself to her and she says, no, thank you. Uh, she didn't just politely say that she would more than likely kill and eat him. So that was not a really good way to start our breeding program. So we set up these aviaries with nest boxes and our, our little nesting chambers inside of them. And that worked out, you know, fairly well. Now here we've got some wonderful little video. I'll just let this play of some of our, our little owls. Now you'll notice these black spots on the backs of their heads. These are false eyes. And they are very, very capable of looking like real eyes. Now you'll see this is both the, the male and the female in here with their little egg. And if we watch up into the corner here shortly, you'll see there's the nestling. Dad's taking care of it, cleaning it up. Mom's trying to get the other one out of the, out of the egg. And watching their behavior is always interesting because when we first started, we were monitoring this. They'd lay the egg, but they'd just be out of the nest. And a day or so later, another egg would be laid and they'd be out of the nest. And we're going, she's not sitting on them. They're just not going to survive. And a third egg would be laid and that's when they would start laying. So they don't start incubating until their third egg is laid. And you can see dad's uh, very actively trying to chase a fly around while mom is still cleaning the baby. And watching this video is a great way for us to really monitor and see what the behavior is and to make sure that the young are, are thriving and doing well. But again, you can see that those magnificent, you know, false eyes and how well they work. And we are again, another little bit of nesting behavior here that uh, listen to their call. And obviously the male is a big partner in caring for the young. Uh, bringing food in and, you know, grooming and cleaning and feeding. So it's uh, been a very, very successful, you know, operation. The problem is after a few years in captivity, their breeding seems to uh, decrease. And so we have been working with other partners to, cre to create, to get more uh, fresh stock about Five years ago, the Phoenix Zoo came to us and with the uh, request that they start actually captive breeding also. So we helped them sign up, you know, set up their facility and they've also been very successful. Um, of course, they have a little bit more funding than we do and more research, uh, more uh, resources. Again, this is inside a, a nesting chamber. It's a fake saguaro boot. And here comes mom in with, with food for the young. And I must admit, they are a goofy looking species when they're small. There's a lot of activity. This actually was video that was used on uh, a National Geographic show called uh, The Wild West. So you know, these youngsters are just <laughs> watching out what's going on. 
And once they start to get a little bit more active, they hop up out of the nest and start to, uh, you know, start to fly around with mom and dad. But she's a very busy mom, making sure that everything is cleaned and everything is fed. So again, here's our, our adult and the young ones. They have their eye colors a little bit lighter when they're young. That darkens as they age. Egg, three little, you know, fairly newly hatched youngsters there. So they're just about ready to pledge out. And the juvenile phase. Again, you can see the light eye color. And we think that we're missing some micronutrients in our in captivity. The Phoenix Zoo has also recorded that their offspring are coming out with much lighter colored eyes than the adults. And so that would be a great study to do to see what kind of uh, micronutrients that are missing from their diet, even though we try and provide them as high quality as possible. Uh, there could be something that we're missing. And we go back into the adult into the adult phase. Yeah, again, you can see how, how tiny these guys are on the hand compared to that. This is a flyway. Now, this is how we figured out how to introduce males to females. There are each of the, there are six enclosures here. Uh, these, the three on the right-hand side open to one another. There are doors in between. But up top here in this flyway, there is a trap door that we can we'll put a male in one aviary, a female in the other, so that they're back, they can see each other. And after they've been acquainted for a bit through the mesh, we'll open up these trap doors. It allows the male to come in and visit the female. And if she doesn't like him, it gives him a chance to get out of Dodge. Once she's out of her enclosure, she doesn't chase him. So it makes it very simple for him. He has an escape route. And uh, guys, we all know what that means. We all need an escape route sometimes. But at least she doesn't carry a frying pan. So this, is a, this was a design that we worked uh, long and hard to try and, and figure out. And it's worked out really, really well. And here you can see you know, some of the activity that goes on through there. The owl entering into the flyway and owls in the flyway going back and forth. And it also gives them a good area to fly around in and make sure that they have enough space and, and they can also visit others in their in the enclosures. They're not an eared owl, they're a round-headed owl, but they also can go into stick form, as we call it, for camouflage. And that helps break, you know, helps break up their, their silhouette a little bit and it makes them look really tough and ferocious. We were the first facility to produce young in the cactus ruginous pygmy owls. And the first one to really determine that need for male, for mate selection for the, you know, protection of the males and the females. Um, it's uh, been a very uh, rewarding process, uh, very difficult. Uh, we're not, we haven't produced a huge number of owls yet, but we have gotten some back out into the wild. And that's, that is the main goal and the focus of this whole process. So we started in 20, one of the issues that we've, we have had is that releasing them, even though they were unlisted, some of the landholders didn't want them released because, well, what if they flow into my land and, and they got listed again, I wouldn't be able to build and, and any of this. So we had to hold them for quite some time. Um, but we were finally able to get some back out into the wild. And the issue now is if they are relisted, we're gonna be back in the same situation. But there are programs that will allow us to hold landholders uh, not responsible, but that takes a year to a year and a half to get established. So we're hopeful that we can continue to breed and release. Right now we're in the process of trying to convince one of the uh, native uh, 
communities to allow us to release on their property because they do have uh, cactus fruits and pygmy owls that live in their areas. We just don't know how many because they do not want fish and wildlife and game and fish on their on their reservation to manage or to know about their wildlife. So, but we have a good working relationship with them, and we're hopeful that by the time they get relisted and we have to do anything, we'll be able to have a good area for release. Um, we do some monitoring with them. We do, or we can, we put uh, transmitters on RF transmitters and have. Uh, volunteers go out and monitor their locations. All the birds, of course, are banded. And, you know, we work with Game and Fish, Fish and Wildlife, Phoenix Zoo, USGS, and a lot of private homeowners. Again, it's the general public that really is important to conservation because they're, the, they're our real resources. They're the ones that can really help us out uh, and help the wildlife out once they're aware of their importance. And here we are, we're uh, <clears throat> banding for the little owls. We put in a US Fish and Wildlife Service band and a colored ID band so that it's easier to spot them in the wild. It's hard to read the Fish and Wildlife bands, but the colored band is a lot easier to, to identify and locate in the wild. When they're released, we put them into a hack site, a hack box like this, where they're kept for several days and they're fed and watered while they're in there. And you can see in 2012, we released one, 16 released near Tucson, five in Ironwood National Forest, again, two and six. So we've had a total of 30 released back into the wild. Um, and we know that they have survived through the length of the transmitters, which only last about six weeks. Because this is such a small bird, you can't put a large transmitter on them. Any any excess weight will help, will diminish their ability to uh, survive and to hunt. And so here, so these these hack sites are set up for four owls or two pairs, and again they're held in there for about a week before they get back out into the wild. And so, yeah, we can see them putting back in, in their, in their little hack sites. And this is how they, they hang out. They have their little nest box. So they can, they can hear, they can, they can get an idea of what their territory is. And then they get released. You can see here, this long wire down here is the antenna for the radio transmitter that's attached. And like I say, after about, six weeks, uh, that battery is no longer uh, viable. And they can chew these off and they have, they, they'll take them off. Now we've got the door open here, ready for this little guy to get released. Uh, there he is up in, the, up in the tree. So this process is ongoing. It's uh, difficult to uh, go through all of this. The breeding right now we have our pairs that are set we have one pair with four eggs a new pair that has just laid their first today and uh, so in about 30 days hopefully we'll have some fledglings that will be able to be released back into the wild eventually this later this year it's a slow process but it's time consuming it it is somewhat expensive but the idea of actually being able to see these back in the wild is so exciting and so rewarding, it makes all of the effort worthwhile. So we've, you know, so we're doing, they brought in two owls to us this year for fresh ones, or actually in 2022. And we find that getting them out of the wild is that first 24 hours out of the nest cavity that they're much easier to capture and bring in. And that's what we're trying to do when, when we're uh, trying to capture new ones to get fresh blood into the breeding program. As you can see, they're, they're like to you know, perch on the trees waiting for something tasty to walk by. And, but this is their natural habitat up in those big saguaro cactus and these wonderful little cavities. The cavities were done by uh, Gila woodpeckers, cactus wrens. They dig, they chip out that hole looking for insects. And then the cactus exudes a uh, material that actually hardens inside that. 
and seals everything off to create a wonderful little cavity uh, that they can get into. Plus the fact is that the saguaro uh, is so full of water that the temperature gradient, when it drops quickly in the uh, exterior, the interior slow gradually cools down and gradually warms up during the day. And that's one of the issues that we've been working with in our artificial nest boxes in the aviaries is trying to come up with the proper mix of uh, temperatures. So that doesn't, so it doesn't affect the eggs or the young. And so that's always been a, an issue trying to make sure we have the correct method of, of doing that. Again, just again, one of, this is the male up there. You can see how beautifully uh, contrasted that that tail, those tail feathers are. Little fledglings that we, that was one of the captures that's now in our breeding program. And uh, one of our volunteers down in, down in the Southwestern uh, Arizona, uh, working, trying to help uh, capture these and monitor them later on in the year. So those are, those are the wonderful things from Wild at Heart, from our, our little birds, and just some great photos. And I think we've got time now for uh, some questions. I hopefully you have some for us. If you're not familiar with the National Geographic photo arc and Joel Sartori's work, please get involved, see that stuff. He, he has done amazing work. He's, he's been here a number of times and shot a number of our birds uh, for the art, but it, it's a wonderful project. Juveniles, male, you can see the shorter tail, it's still growing in, okay? 